we're going to open this up for questions in a minute, but I just wanted to talk um, uh, briefly about um, President Obama's State of the Union mm -hmm. recently, which um, threw down a challenge to um, American innovation and ingenuity. And he talked about a Sputnik moment, said the country was facing a, um, a real turning point. And um, uh, he, he seemed to raise the question of whether US technology leadership that we've all taken for granted for so long is in jeopardy. Uh, is it at risk? I think the United States, on one hand, is still creating many of the most uh, talented, uh, educated people on the planet. We have arguably the best universities in the world. There are other countries that have great universities, too. The U.S. has a lot of them. And uh, that's great on one hand. On the other hand, we have a crisis, I believe, in our educational system right now in that uh, for us to compete as a country, uh, we do not have enough people going into science and math and engineering uh, in order to push that forward. Uh, there are many other countries that have taken that as an initiative. Uh, they're getting much higher scores. They're graduating more engineers. And they're encouraging people to make that a career. And so, uh, you know, there's a longer topic we can go into. But Broadcom, for example, believes this is such a crisis that we've created the Broadcom Foundation. And one of the things we've done in the Broadcom Foundation is we are now sponsoring middle school science fairs across the country, uh, providing prize money and, and various other kinds of things, I think, to drive this. But um, it's going to be a multifaceted effort of how do we fix this and how do we make it fun. And the reason we chose middle schools is because middle school is when the average person makes a decision about whether they're going to go forward with science or math. And especially for minorities or for women or other people who may have had less experience in this, if they don't decide in eighth grade or so that they want to go into this area, it's not going to happen because they're not going to take the right courses, they're going to be behind and they won't catch up. So you know, these are kinds of things I think that we as a country, and many other countries of the world, I think you know, the UK, Europe has the same challenges, uh, but we as a country, I think, need to really take this seriously or we will lose our lead. You obviously made a decision after studying psychology to go into computer science. Um, if you were back at that point in your life again, would you make the same decision? Because it just seems a lot of people in, that, in the position you were in are just not making the decision anymore. Have, does the world just look different to people in that, in that position? When I was a kid, science was much more accessible. You could play with devices, you could do things. Um, in the you interest, could make things. You, you could, could make things, things, you could make explosives, you could do all, you know. And, and you know, when you're, an eighth grade, when you're an eighth grade kid, that's pretty exciting, right? And you could make things that make smoke or bad smells or, or you, could, you could shock yourself with something. And I think one of the things that we've done is we've made stuff so safe. I mean, have you guys looked at a chemistry set these days? It is the most boring thing in the world. If you're, the most exciting thing in a chemistry set these days is you can put two drops of stuff you could drink together and it will make bubbles, okay, or turn slightly green, okay? And we don't have things that excite people about technology and the world and a lot of that hands-on learning that I think happen. And so we need to figure out how to get more of that. So we've turned it into theory it's, and it's boring. It's, it's boring, but and I think we need to make it exciting. And that's one of the things, for example, science fairs do. They encourage kids to get hands-on experience and do real technology. Yeah. Talking of making things, your company doesn't make things. You have a lot of brain power. But like a, a lot of US tech companies now, you design things, and then somebody else somewhere else, normally China or Taiwan, makes it. Um, I'm hearing more and more people say the US has to get back to making things now in technology to really keep its lead. Is that true? Well, making things, you can make things that are of intellectual property and you can make things that are physical devices. Uh, Broadcom creates the technology behind these chips and the designs and creates the very detailed blueprints, if you will, that we turn over to other places to manufacture because, frankly, the labor cost is a lot lower and we would die if we tried to make that in the United States with the labor cost in the United States reality in the electronics business is that almost all of the manufacturing has moved overseas. Now, does it make sense to do that in the United States? Well, you need to solve the difference in labor cost. You know, yes, it'd be great to make it in the United States, but until you solve the difference, factor of 10 difference in labor cost, you would have to subsidize it so much. Now, the thing I think the United States needs to pay attention to is don't lose the creation of that intellectual property. 
Okay? You may have lost some of the hourly wage manufacturing skills, and, and until the, the labor corrects, that's a problem. But don't lose the intellectual property piece of it, the, the creation of, of intellect, uh, the engineering and stuff. If you lose that, that will be very hard to get back. You can get the manufacturing back if you address the labor uh, issues. You can't get the intellectual property back if you but lose e that. But even if the U.S. technology industry, industry succeeds, it's not going to create a lot of jobs in the U.S. then? Well, I think it will create a lot of jobs. I mean, Broadcom hired 1,800 people last year. I mean, there... How many of those are in the U.S.? Most. Mm -hmm. most, of our, most of our employees are in the United States. Uh, we have relatively high-paid jobs. Uh, the average uh, wage of a U.S. employee at Broadcom is, is a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so these I are good jobs. I think you'll get jobs. a few resumes at these the are, end of this. These are, <laughs> no. these are, these are, good, these right. are good jobs, and they pay a lot of taxes. Good. And, well, uh, let's... Let's open this one up for questions. Our namesake, um, Peter Drucker in 1954 in his book, The Practice of Management, um, said that any enterprise that attempts to centralize responsibility at the top is, is destined not to succeed. So just a quick question about your management style and leadership at Broadcom. At Broadcom, uh, I believe very much in decentralizing decisions and decentralizing management. And one of the biggest mistakes a lot of the tech companies can make is when you have a very strong founder or a uh, single individual who tries to centralize too much decision making. And what's important and what's worked very well for us is that Broadcom has a number of businesses. We have 20 some odd businesses at Broadcom, each one headed by a general manager who makes decisions on pricing, product roadmap, which customers they work with, and they own that. Okay, and every morning, they get up and they worry about how is that business doing and we measure them on lots of financial metrics and how much do they spend and what resources do we get. Uh, but they have the ownership of that and so that decentralizes a lot of those decisions and I think that's allowed Broadcom to scale where many companies uh, uh, fail uh, by enabling those people to do that and pushing that decision making down. You talked about your interest in education, and there is a field that seems to me touching both of your areas of background called persuasive technologies, which is the use of human technology interactions to influence or persuade, presumably in an empowering way. What do you see as the future of persuasive technologies and the use of these chips and human technology interactions to persuade and its potential role in education? I think technology is um, a tool, and where it's going is it's going to enable us to have more power in the hands of more people at low cost. So the technology that a student will be able to carry with them is going to go up by orders of magnitude over the next decade. And that technology, I believe, can be used for incredibly valuable things. There's no reason to have physical textbooks anymore. Uh, I watch my kids go to school and I can't lift their backpack that they're carrying with all those books in it. There's no reason not to have all that uh, on a tablet or something that they take with them. Uh, there's no reason why the students shouldn't have access to curriculum materials uh, from lots of different places. So by persuasive technology, I'm going to invert that a little bit to learning technology, you know, the ability to help me learn. Uh, I think we can get that from lots of different sources. Uh, there's no reason why somebody on any place on this planet shouldn't be able to get access to curriculum materials that will help them learn anything they want. And I think that's going to be a, a, a quite a revolution. And there's a lot of initiatives, the one laptop per child initiative is trying to do that and other things. But as this technology drops the price of in incredible power that you can put in a student's hands and the internet connects all of that, making it possible to get access to it, I believe that is the, the Petri dish, if you will, that will enable you know, just learning like we haven't seen it before to everyone on the planet. The techniques of persuasion and propaganda grow exponentially as well. Absolutely. I think one of the most important learning skills in that world where you have access to information is critical thinking. Okay, and this is something I think our education system doesn't do as good a job on is critical thinking. Teaching people how to learn basic logic, you know, what's right, why is that person telling me this, what's in it for them, and you know, some of that you would call street smart, some is sort of basic logic syllogisms. Uh, but I think all of us need to understand 
you're going to get information from a lot of different sources. How do you decide what's right and what's wrong? That's a moral compass, but it's also an intellectual capability to sort uh, the I wheat had, from the chaff. I heard someone yesterday talking about intellectual spam. Um, you know, that actually <laughs> now we're phrase. used to all this spam, <laughs> but all this stuff is processed and given to us now. A lot of it's intellectual spam. That's, uh, mm -hmm. My father joined IBM in 1961 and worked there for 35 years, and, and uh, he strongly remembers uh, sitting a, in, a, in a meeting and the executives at, at IBM saying, you know, hardware's where it's at, this, the software stuff, we've got this little guy in Seattle that we're going to get to help us with that. And they kind of missed the boat. And, and IBM struggled for years, and then the so software industry exploded. You're providing products and technologies and technologies today that make them work better, faster, quicker, more effectively and efficiently. But how do you look to the future to position your company appropriately for that next wave, you know, of that next new technology that's 10 years out? How do you do that? I think that's a very fundamental question, and everybody who runs a business better spend some time thinking about that because the more successful you are, okay, the more you can get stuck into a particular model. And IBM that you mentioned is a great example. Now, IBM is also a great example of a company reinventing itself. Okay, IBM uh, originally was a data tabulator company, and they sort of transitioned to computers very well. And then when the box revenue started to have lower margins, they transitioned to more of a software and a services company, which they're very successful in today. So that's a great example of transformation over a period of time. Uh, in, in our industry, uh, currently we're benefiting from uh, a phrase I like is we're all sort of running up the down escalator. Okay, all of this technology is sliding into the little microelectronics. So a lot of what makes all of these cool devices work is moving away from some of the boxes themselves into the microelectronics and into the software on them, as well as on the other side into the services uh, that are provided. So information as a service and other kinds of services you buy. Uh, so today we're at a good phase in that. Over time, the value may shift more towards services, more towards software. And so we as a company constantly have discussions on that and, you know, we better call that right. Uh, and it's, it's a classic case of a company that gets a little too comfortable and a little too big with something that works and then they miss the phenomena that, that wipes them out. And, you know, the classic case is mini computers, okay? You go back, IBM was gonna really do well in mini computers, and there were a number of other companies that you probably don't remember anymore, because they focused on mini computers, and the PC wiped them out. Okay, the interesting question right now is, well, is the PC gonna get wiped out by tablets and smartphones? Maybe. And so, these are the transitions that anybody running a company, whatever's specific to your industry, better pay attention to.